I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Natalia Ortiz, and this is Currents. We walk in the footsteps of one New Yorker on his path to sainthood. He's always thinking of other people. It's always what can he do for others. Evangelizing a new generation using new media. The mission has always been to talk to spiritual seekers. This enormous generation of people that are spiritual but not religious. And a Power Ranger morphs into a swimsuit designer. Good evening, Francesca Maxime is off tonight. We're almost there, the unofficial end of summer. Where in the world did the time go? Well, there's still time to get outside though and enjoy the nice weather this coming weekend. New Yorkers may be getting ready for one final weekend at the beach. But if the city is more your thing, there's plenty to do, including tours. And New York City has any type of tour you can think of. Bus tours and walking tours visiting neighborhoods and popular landmarks. That is absolutely correct. And the Municipal Art Society of New York actually has a tour that lets you walk in the footsteps of a man who is on the road to sainthood. Mm -hmm. That man is Pierre Toussaint, and like many others who've eventually been declared saints, his path has been an unlikely one. And our camera is caught up with one of those tours, guided by urban historian James Sullivan, who spoke to us about Toussaint's life and work. He was a quintessential New Yorker in that he traveled every street in town, um, walked the city up and down. Although English was his second language and he spoke it very imperfectly, he was French. He was in touch with New York high society. The Hamiltons, the Schuylers, the Livingstons, the Stevens. Well, what's fascinating about Toussaint is that when he comes to New York, he is a slave. But, sh but very soon after he arrives, he begins to earn money as a hairdresser. And he begins to buy the freedom of other slaves, but not his own. And he remains a slave in his own relationship with the mistress. He says, because his freedom belongs to her. My freedom belongs to my mistress. In other words, he's always thinking of other people. It's always, what can he do for others? He's exactly the kind of a, of a personality that the church fathers are talking about in the, in the early 1960s at the Second Vatican Council, where they, where they are writing a document on the apostolate of the laity. And they are saying that the lay person lives their life, their Christian life, in the world. And you see this ability of bringing religion into the workplace as so typifies Toussaint. He's working all day long seeing people all day long, seeing people on Saturday, seeing customers in the evenings. And yet, while he's working, he is able to, to radiate this intense spirituality. Back uh, when I was a student, in my student days, I was told about him in a, uh, uh, in a class. And the professor mentioned that, um, that he was black. And that intrigued me, because uh, I had associated African Americans with, uh, not with the Catholic religion, but with the Protestant religion. And so the fact that he was a Roman Catholic, um, I began to want to learn more about him, or I became interested in him for that reason. Since Pierre lived in Lower New York, and he lived in what is now called Tribeca, um, the tour consists of the Tribeca area, also the City Hall area, Lower New York, uh, he had clients, his clientele extended as far as the city extended in his lifetime. So he had people up in this, in this neighborhood. He didn't stop his hairdressing business until the late 1840s, maybe, maybe about 1850, and then he, be, he really begins to retire. He's not physically capable anymore. Here you find a, the marker for Pierre Toussaint. This is a marker that was created in, uh, in 1992. There was no marker when the remains were found in 1990. There were the remains of a marker that said Toussaint with some of the letters rubbed away. But that marker was not in this position. 
So when they began to dig the, for the remains and they worked off of that old marker, uh, they did not uncover uh, Pierre's remains. But then uh, the second time, a, an additional effort did yield three skeletons, three coffins, piled one on top of the other. And there they found Pierre, his wife Juliet, and his adopted niece Euphemia, who died at 14. He was a Catholic and a very good one, but he was also an amazing human being uh, with many, many gifts. Um, an ability to reach out to all kinds of people. And I think that that is the essence of Tucson. The Pierre Toussaint walking tour there, and it was really quite a privilege for us to be able to follow that tour because, mm -hmm. you know, James Sullivan only gives it once a year through the Municipal Arts Society. And you can arrange a private tour by contacting Sullivan. We've posted more information about that online. Well, stay tuned. There's much more Currents coming up straight ahead. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Natalia Ortiz. Coming up a little later, as summer comes to a close, I'll investigate a cover-up at the beach. But first, a look at the day's headlines. Cardinal Sean O'Malley, Boston's Archbishop, is explaining his decision to preside at the funeral of pro-choice Senator Ted Kennedy. On the Cardinal's blog, O'Malley writes that, as the Archbishop, he felt it appropriate to represent the Church out of respect for Kennedy, his family, and all those who were praying for the late Senator. The Cardinal also expressed his disagreement with those who thought Kennedy should be denied a Catholic funeral, pointing to the Pope imparting a blessing to the Senator shortly before his death. In a letter to Pope Benedict, Senator Kennedy acknowledged his failings. Those failings will also be part of Kennedy's memoirs, set to be released later this month. In the book, titled True Compass, he writes over his remorse over the infamous Chappaquiddick incident in which a woman passenger in his car died after he drove off a bridge. Kennedy wrote that he made terrible decisions and called his actions inexcusable. And how would you feel about paying a politician to go to church? Well, Reverend C. Welton Gaddy of Louisiana says no go to Governor Bobby Jindal, who reportedly used state money for flights he made to attend church services, many at Protestant churches, though he is a Catholic. Jindal told the local paper he only goes when he's invited, and the visits he made gave him a chance to talk to the citizens. However, Gaddy isn't buying it and doesn't think any other Louisiana taxpayer should have to either. He claims the flight tab is $45,000. Well, turning to news now from overseas, the World Council of Churches has joined Pakistani Christians in calling for a law against blaspheming Islam to be repealed. The council says Christians in Pakistan live in constant fear of persecution, execution, or even being killed because of the law. Violence in this country last month sparked by reportedly false allegations that some Christians had desecrated the Quran, led to the deaths of eight people. A Pakistani government official says the country will soon review that law. Well, first at the Vatican, Pope Benedict has appointed the first assistant master of ceremonies from an African country. Congolese priest Father Jean-Pierre Kwambamba Massey will serve beside the Pope in liturgical ceremonies. Well, stay tuned. There's much more Currents coming up straight ahead. Coming up, rethinking media as the landscape changes. But everybody from the New York Times down to the local Boston newspaper is struggling with the same thing. How do we keep readers? How do we keep eyeballs? Welcome back. The net is part of a new evangelization. That's right, you know, NET, New mm -hmm. Evangelization Television, <laughs> hence the name. But there are others out there who are casting their nets as well, like the guys and gals over at Busted Halo. It's a website, a podcast, and a serious satellite radio show. They do a lot. Yep. And I recently had a chance to visit with Busted Halo editor-in-chief, Bill McGarvey. Well, thanks for having me today. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming by. Good to see you. <laughs> First of all, I just wanted to start out. Tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, um, how you got involved in this whole Catholic media thing. Uh, it's completely kind of happenstance, to be honest with you, Matt. I, I, uh, for years, I'm a musician. I've moved to New York, and I'm a songwriter. made secular music and still do uh, for a long time, uh, toured, et cetera, et cetera. And I happened to have a college degree in English, an English major, and along the way, rather than sort of bartender wait tables. I was fortunate enough to get jobs 
doing editorial sort of temp work here and there. And then a friend of mine uh, from America Magazine and Commonwealth Magazine, both Catholic magazines who were friends, uh, called me and told me about this thing about us at Halo that we're looking for an editor-in-chief. And so I applied, not really knowing anything about it, but that sort of just kind of fell into it. Um, so I wasn't looking, I'd never worked for a church organization or for Catholic media at all, so we're kind of, I've been making it up as I kind of go along. You know? <laughs> well, that's always good. Now, um, that's kind of how I operate all the exactly, time. Exactly, right. <laughs> so what does media in the Catholic Church look like today? I mean, it's changing. It's the face of Catholic media, like media everywhere, is changing. I mean, uh, we often talk about here of us at Halo that, you know, coming from a print magazine background, but we're doing video on our site. We're doing a lot of interactive things. I don't really think of us as doing magazines as much as we're doing media now. And that means everything from, from longer form video to short form video to audio to text to more interactive features. So I think that's where media in general is moving. They call it, we talk about Web 2.0. The fact of the matter is nobody's on the cutting edge as far as I can tell. Nobody knows where the edge is anymore. It just keeps expanding out like a large sort of puddle or some water form. You can substitute whatever you want there. So uh, I think it's always been, it's, 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 uh, it's tough to sort of to put your finger on. I think the Catholic Church, unfortunately, so a lot of Catholic organizations are a little frightened of a lot of new media because it's a lot less controllable. It's not, we print it, you get it. It's, we print it, you comment, you, com you know, and, and, and that interactivity can be frightening if you have a message you want to get out there that sometimes might be uh, at odds with, with the, the institutional message. So it is a learning curve that I think is happening, and we do a lot of Bust the Halo to try to talk to a lot of people throughout the church who do media about how, what the new media landscape is. So um, it's, I think, slowly, you know, it's, the, the 20, it's moving into the 21st century. It has to... But everybody from the New York Times down to the local Boston newspaper is struggling with the same thing. How do we keep readers? How do we keep eyeballs? And it's, and it's hard. So I think it's on a learning curve like everybody. It's maybe a little behind of the curves a lot of times, except for, of course, the net, which is way, <laughs> I mean, so far advanced. We only hope someday to be where you all are. <laughs> well, you <laughs> talked a little bit about uh, people maybe being a little nervous about yeah. using this technology and some controversy surrounding that. What about controversy with the types of stories that Catholic media covers? Ha have there been controversies regarding that? Sure. I mean, and truth be told, bustedhalo.com, the website that I run, is it's started by the Paulus Fathers and owned by the Paulus Fathers. And the mission has always been to talk to spiritual seekers. The Paulus have had a charism. They were founded by Father Isaac Hecker, who was a convert. In fact, the charism has always been about talking to people outside the church. So truth be told, we obviously are owned by a Catholic organization and, and if you look at our website, there's tons of Catholic content. But our, uh, our general sort of uh, mission is to talk to spiritual seekers, which is this, gen this enormous generation of people that are spiritual but not religious. Um, so that means we have to talk about reality. So, you know, if you, there are hot button issues in terms of, of course, sex and sexuality are always hot button issues. So if you talk, we recently had uh, a good friend, Sister Bernadette Reese, who's a daughter of St. Paul, a traditional sister in her habit talking to her openly gay cousin who she's known since they were children about you know the church and about faith and about his sexuality and her sexuality and and it was it wasn't like coming up with any great doctrinal mess it was just talking about relationally and that gets a ton of attention because these are issues that people are trying to deal with and talk about it and talk about within the church and outside the church so uh, you can sometimes um, it can it, some people's feathers can be ruffled but the fact of the matter is we're trying to talk to the world and and if you're not where the, if you're not on the web talking about the issues that, that are relevant to the then you're not talking to people. And it's, I always liken it to like, you know, St. Paul didn't go 12 miles west of Thessalonia and say, come to me, talk to me. He went to Thessalonia and talked. You gotta be where people are. If you're not, you're not there. Yeah. So. Um, do you think that the church, that the Catholic church in particular, is doing enough um, in regards to using media today? It's still changing, and, and I, don't, I hate to. I think it's, 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 of course, the Catholic Church is an enormous, you know, billion strong, uh, and it's got lots of, you know, sort of affiliates around the world, lots of dioceses. So it, uh, it depends on where you're talking about. Obviously, places like Brooklyn, they're really trying to embrace technology. Other places, a little more reticent, and it's getting, it, but I think those people are changing because they realize this is just where everybody has to go, and, and that. While the downside might be certain levels of control might not be there that they were with print media, that they're still, they're still to not be there is a, is a bigger wrong than to, to take that risk. All right, Bill, well, thanks for having me over. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for being here.
Bill McGarvey, the editor-in-chief of Busted Halo. Hmm, interesting interview, Matt. I oh, know yeah, he's a fun guy, yeah. and uh, they do a lot of media work. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, at Busted Halo, as you were saying earlier, they yeah. do the, the podcast. is just one sort of branch of that. They also have the website, which is expansive. Okay. They have the Sirius Satellite Radio Show, hosted by uh, Father Dave Dwyer. So they they're do a lot. So they're, they're really um, involved in, in Catholic media on a, such a wide scale. And that's great because actually they're covering so much ground there with the yeah. podcast and everything else that it's hard for you to miss them. If you if, if you you, know, you really have to not be looking for it, you know, if, if you want it, it's out there and that's great right. that they're dealing with all these issues that, you know, usually you don't hear a lot of, of talk about sexuality and these type of things in the Catholic media. So right, it's great. Right. Well that, and you know, I mean, that's what Bill said it, exactly is you have to go where the people are mm -hmm. and talk about what the people are talking about mm -hmm. because if not, you're kind of on the wrong page. Right. So I, I really, I, you know, I really thought that that was a great thought from him so about their whole perspective and the Paulist perspective too. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, very important. It's a great one. And actually, on tomorrow's show, I'll go a little bit deeper into the subject of new media. We're dedicating the entire show to technology and the church, and uh, I'll actually meet the guys uh, from the Bus of the Halo podcast. So uh, tune in for that tomorrow, and I'll be here in the anchor chair all by myself. Oh my. <laughs> Stay tuned, we've still got more of today's currents straight ahead. Just ahead, cover up. Don't you know you're at the beach? Well, we are almost there, the mm -hmm. unofficial final weekend of the summer. Can you believe it? No. Well, come Tuesday, it's back to school and back into the swing of things for most New Yorkers. But there's still a chance to get one last day at the beach, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> but if this woman has anything to say, you may see more modesty at the beach. Jessica Ray is a Hollywood actress. She was once known as the White Tiger Wild Force Ranger on the Power Rangers television show. <laughs> well, how, and how far she's come from that, right? Mm -hmm. At one point, though, she found that the Hollywood life was something less than fulfilling. Now she travels the country preaching chastity and modesty to young women. Jessica Ray is also helping women maintain a more modest image with a special line of swimwear. I recently had a chance to sit down and chat with her about this. Hi guys, we're with Hollywood actress Jessica Ray, who's designed, believe it or not, a brand new line of swimsuit, modest swimsuits, and uh, they're very cute. Tell us a little bit about it. Thank you. Um, well, one day I decided to never wear a bikini ever again because I was learning more about modesty and thought that they were immodest. Okay. So I went out shopping and I think I literally shopped for two or three weeks straight and could okay. not find what I was looking for. <laughs> um, all the swimsuits that were considered modest were kind of for, like, they were like matronly or for older women. Right. So without any prior experience or background in fashion, this former Power Ranger took it upon herself to design her own modest swimsuit with a little more flair. Well, a lot of people think that um, dressing modestly, that we cover ourselves because our bodies are bad or they're dirty and you know we should then cover them. But uh, in Love and Responsibility, Pope John Paul II, before he was the Pope, wrote that there's a difference between um, what you see in Playboy magazine and the art that you would see in the Sistine Chapel. Okay. So it's all in the, in, in, in the perception then, I guess is what we're right. getting at. But many people perceive modest fashion as unfashionable. So what tips can Ray offer to women who want to wear cutting edge styles, but still cover up? You don't want to be stuck wearing something like you said, matronly, something your grandmother might wear, your Aunt right. Bertha, we all have one of those, right? <laughs> what do we do to avoid looking frumpy, but also, you know, fit into this modest um, kind of look that we're, we're talking about. It's really hard. Actually, I was um, giving a talk to a group of girls yesterday and I was talking a little bit about modesty and this girl, high schooler, looked at me and said, what are we supposed to wear? And her friend looked <laughs> yeah. at her and said, you're supposed to dress like a grandma. <laughs> and I was like, no, 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 you're not. And then I stood in front of them and said, do I look like a grandma right. to you? And they're like, no, 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 you look good, you look good. And, um, so I will say that it is more difficult to look modest and stylish. Um, and it does take a little bit more time when you're shopping. Um, and we don't have very 
many good examples. But one good example Jessica used as inspiration is Audrey Hepburn, a classic Hollywood icon who many believe personifies beauty and style in a modest way. She's a fashion icon. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows who she is. She's beautiful and she's not you know, half naked and showing everything that she has. She was very stylish. Jessica feels confident women can look pretty while wearing what the church considers proper attire. But what exactly is that? Who sets the rules here? Who sets the bar for, you know, how long my skirt's supposed to be? Like, is there a big manual, like in the church, I'm supposed to go <laughs> How does it work? I think it just depends. I mean, some girls have bigger breasts okay. than others, yeah. um, whereas, you know, the girl with bigger breasts may have to have a higher neckline. Sure. So it's it's difficult to say. Um, Padre Pio, they say that on his uh, confessional door had a sign that said, if your dress or skirt is not eight inches below your knee, then go away and come back. Okay. Um, so I was explaining to this, this to this girl, and she looked at herself and said, I don't have eight inches below my <laughs> knee. <laughs> Because she was really short. Oh, well, I'd be in trouble too, by the view. <laughs> and for those of you who'd rather stay out of trouble, Jessica Ray has the swimsuit for you. Jessica Ray, actress and designer of modest swimwear. Well, that's, you know, I, I love it because it was great stuff. Those were some great pieces mm -hmm. that you wouldn't uh, Im immediately think of when you hear modest swimwear. Mm -hmm. You do. I mean, you think of like, okay, grandma wear. You, you do. Know? Us women, you know, most women are very much into fashion and style, myself included. And so it's a big concern to us, you know, if we've got to dress modestly now, then, you know, are we still going to be, you know, trendy? And, and yes, it's possible. Possible. You have yeah. to be very smart about it. You have to take your time. It's, it's more time consuming, most definitely, as she says. Right. But it's possible. And what I love is she says there's no hard and fast rule. So you don't have to go with like a ruler and measure, you know, below yeah. your knee. I mean, use common sense, people. You know, if, if you've got certain body parts that you know and you know what they are, <laughs> you know, just try to be careful with them. That's you don't want to be, you know, hanging out of your clothes, but right. you don't want to, you don't want to like, you know, just put a burlap sack over correct, yourself and correct. walk out the door well, either. We can, we, we, there's nothing wrong with <laughs> trying to look attractive, you know, definitely, right. I don't think. <laughs> right, right. Just keep it under wraps. That's right. <laughs> okay. Well, that's all for this edition of Currents. Now, coming up tomorrow, it's all me. And that is a scary thing. <laughs> no, we'll be talking about, we'll actually be talking about the church and new technology. It's called Megabytes with Matt, so join me then. But until then, remember you can always watch us online. Just go to netny.net slash currents. You can watch clips of the show, meet the people in front of the camera and behind the scenes as well. And check out our blog, Writing the Wave. And while you're there at our website, let us know what you think as well. You can send us an email. The address is drop us a line, that's all one word, at currentsny. Dot net. Well, for all of us here at Currents, I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Natalia Ortiz. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.